Escott. The Department of Commerce has imposed new controls on exports of U.S. luxury goods to Russia and Belarus to ensure those propagating this war of choice cannot enjoy or benefit from these U.S. products. We have also imposed an import ban on Russian alcohol, seafood, and non-industrial diamonds, and we're working with Congress to revoke Russia's permanent normal trade relations, commonly referred to as most favored nation status. In addition to the practical steps we are taking to impose costs on Russia, our commitment to supporting Ukraine and to countering Russian disinformation is steadfast. We will not waver in our clear support for Ukraine's right to pursue its European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations. The Kremlin does not stand and cannot dictate, excuse me, the Kremlin does not and cannot dictate the foreign policy decisions of other countries. That simple principle is at the heart of the world's steadfast support for Ukraine. The Russian Federation called the UN Security Council resolution meeting today in an attempt to use the Security Council as a platform, platform to further sow disinformation about biological and chemical weapons. As Ambassador Thomas Greenfield said, Russia asked the Security Council for today's meeting for the sole purpose of lying and spreading disinformation. Using the Security Council as a venue for spreading lies is repugnant, but it is also par for the course for President Putin and his cronies. Putin may be counting on the United States and the international community to lose focus, to move on. I want to be clear. We will not lose focus. We will not move on. The world will not lose focus, nor will it move on. We are and will remain committed to the United and united with Ukraine. There will be no relief from sanctions or other costs we have and will continue to impose on Russia until President Putin reverses course and relents in his brutal aggression. With that, happy to turn to questions. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, I don't want to be accused of losing focus, but I do want to start with Iran rather than Ukraine. Okay. I'm sure you'll get a lot of I just, and I think this can be dispensed with fairly quickly. Um, what's your understanding of the situation with the pause, Russians, Russia's uh, relationship to the pause? Well, uh, Matt, the special envoy, Rob Malley, and his team have uh, returned to Washington today for uh, consultations. Uh, they just uh, have returned. Uh, to D.C. Uh, as we've said before, these are complex negotiations. Uh, we're still working through a number, a very small number, but uh, still a number, of what are undoubtedly difficult issues. Uh, I made this point uh, yesterday, but uh, when you're at this stage of a negotiation, 11 months in, this, these are indirect negotiations that started last April, uh, you are going to get down uh, gradually to a very small number of the hardest issues. And these hardest, these issues are hardest because uh, they are complex, they are challenging. Uh, but we continue to believe uh, that we are close to a potential deal. Now is the time for all parties to demonstrate uh, that seriousness of purpose. We can and we should be able to reach a mutual understanding to return to full implementation of the JCPOA uh, but there is very little time remaining uh, to do that. Um, you've heard from Joseph Burrell uh, that there are uh, essentially, uh, we're close, uh, but there are external factors uh, that are also uh, now interceding uh, in these uh, negotiations. Uh, but uh, delegations are returning to capitals. There will need to be decisions made uh, in places like Tehran uh, and Moscow. Uh, and if that uh, political will uh, is there, if that seriousness of purpose is there, uh, we remain confident that we can achieve a mutual return to compliance uh, in fairly short order. Do you, uh, but so no decisions need to be made here in Washington? It's uh, basically you guys are ha satisfied with where things are uh, and it's up to the Iranians to resolve that small number of issues and the Russians to resolve their sanctions? I, I don't want to uh, parse too much uh, these, uh, this set, this very small uh, number of remaining issues, uh, but I will just uh, leave it at the fact that we are confident that we can achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA uh, if uh, there is seriousness of purpose, if those decisions are made uh, in places like uh, Tehran and Moscow. Okay, well, is it when, he, when you noted, you said that he mentioned external factors, but is, is it really plural? 
or is it just one external factor? I, I will. Uh, and can you spe explain? Spe speaking of things, I'm not going to parse. I'm not going to parse the uh, okay, the tweets well then, of. What uh, are the external factors specifically? I mean, can we just put a fine point on it? It's the Russians demand that that sanction that Ukraine-related sanctions not interfere with. Well, and and in response to that, we've been very clear, including from this podium yesterday. Uh, that the new Russia-related sanctions are wholly and entirely unrelated to the JCPOA. They shouldn't have any impact on a potential implementation of uh, the JCPOA. Uh, we've also similarly, similarly been clear that we have no intention of offering Russia anything new or specific uh, as it relates to these sanctions, uh, nor is nor would that be required. Uh, there is nothing required to successfully reach an agreement uh, on a mutual return to full, compl full implementation of the JCPOA. Simon. Um, moving to Russia, um, I wonder if you could respond to a couple of things that um, President Putin has, has said. Um, firstly, his comment about there being positive shifts in diplomacy. You know, do, do you see any, any positive shifts? Um, do you have any idea, you know, what that might be that he's referring to is there something positive that's come out of the meeting between Lavrov and Kuleba in Turkey and and secondly um, he mentioned the um, 16,000 th volunteers from the Middle East who are going to fight alongside the Russian forces in Ukraine you know do you have any any response to that in terms of the diplomacy uh, we would certainly welcome uh, a positive reorientation uh, of the various diplomatic tracks and I call it a, a reorientation uh, because it would require uh, a shift in what we've seen to date. Uh, I, of course, we weren't a party uh, to yesterday's uh, discussions in Antalya, uh, but uh, you heard from Foreign Minister Kuleba uh, before he went into those talks. You heard from him uh, after he emerged from those talks. Uh, before he went into those talks, he said that uh, Ukraine appropriately had low expectations. Uh, and it seems that those low expectations uh, may or may not uh, have been met. Uh, he said after the fact that uh, Moscow, it seems, the impression he was left, left with, continues to uh, essentially uh, ask for, advocate, demand the complete surrender uh, of Ukraine. Uh, of course, that is, not, that is not genuine diplomacy. That strikes us as something much more akin to what we've talked about before, and that is the pretense of diplomacy. Going through the diplomatic motions, taking part in meetings, doing so uh, occasionally at senior levels to include uh, at a ministerial level, uh, as took place yesterday, without having any genuine intent of seeking to make progress on the under underlying issues. Uh, that is what it now seems quite clear that we saw prior to uh, the Russian invasion. It is what we uh, were concerned and we warned about uh, potentially seeing prior to uh, the Russian invasion. It seems that's what uh, we may be seeing now. Uh, if there is a positive movement, of course we would welcome that, uh, but we would want to hear that uh, not from the Russian Federation, uh, which has continually, continually and continuously uh, mischaracterized uh, its intent, its objectives, its goals, um, and we would want to hear that from our Ukrainian partners. On the, the volunteers from the Middle East. On, uh, look, we've seen these reports. Uh, we've seen Putin's comments about uh, Syrian foreign fighters. Uh, if true, uh, this would represent an even further escalation in Russia's unjustified, unprovoked, uh, premeditated uh, aggression, and now it's, it's brutal war uh, against Ukraine. Uh, Russia is uh, and would be pulling from its destructive, uh, its destabilizing playbook uh, that has uh, – brought havoc uh, to places like Syria. Uh, Rus Russia's focus should be on stopping the war. It started needlessly uh, on an unjustified and premeditated basis, uh, rather than adding to uh, the further suffering of the Ukrainian people, further casualties uh, that Moscow has experienced. And this also speaks, I think, to the fundamental miscalculations uh, that Putin has made uh, in choosing the path of war over the path of diplomacy. Uh, it seems quite clear uh, from a number of indications, including, uh, again, if true, the fact that the Russian Federation feels the need to pull so-called volunteers uh, from other theaters, uh, that R President Putin and those around him 
severely miscalculated if they thought that they would uh, aggress against a sovereign, independent country uh, and not encounter fierce resistance. Uh, it's clear that they are encountering fierce resistance. And you can see that in the fact that even Russian state uh, media, even Russian government officials are now admitting to the fact that Russian soldiers, husbands, brothers, sons are dying, that they are coming home in body bags if the Russian government bothers to bring home their remains at all. Uh, we are seeing that now discussed openly uh, on Russian media, in Russian media. This is something that, as you know, uh, the Russians have hesitated uh, to do and went to great lengths, in fact, to avoid doing in terms of uh, their uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine that started in 2014. Uh, as we know, they went to great lengths to obscure uh, the losses and the casualties that uh, Russia was facing. There is no obscuring, there is no hiding uh, these losses uh, because uh, they are quite uh, profound in terms uh, of their scale. Um, of course, that doesn't speak to the full toll of human suffering that this invasion, this needless invasion, has precipitated. Uh, the Ukrainian people, innocent Ukrainian civilians, uh, are uh, suffering, are dying. Ukrainians are being forced uh, to flee their houses, their homes, to flee their country. Uh, and the toll on the Russian people. Of course, our, our actions are not aimed at the Russian people, uh, but our actions, as we promised, uh, have been consequential, uh, have been uh, profound in terms of uh, their impact. Uh, President Biden uh, pledged that if President Putin went forward with this aggression, uh, we would, together with our partners and allies, enact uh, these series of measures. And as President Biden has said, uh, big nations don't bluff. Uh, we were not bluffing in this case. The G7, uh, with which we acted again today, uh, was not bluffing uh, in this case. The 141 countries uh, that came together to condemn uh, this needless aggression, uh, they were not uh, bluffing in this case. And so the toll because the response has been so united, so unified uh, around the world, of course it has had a toll on everyday Russians. Um, just as we have targeted our, our actions at President Putin, his cronies, the oligarchs, uh, his lieutenants, uh, the, these, these measures uh, will be felt uh, and are being felt uh, across Russia. I wonder if it's just another uh, quick thing. That I, there's some reporting that the Ukrainian embassy here in Washington is helping uh, Americans who want to go and fight. Um, you know, we've seen a lot more of that coming out and reporting that, you know, Americans and other nations are going there. Is, is there anything, any change to your advice uh, on that? And, and, and do you have anything to say about the Ukrainian embassy playing a role in that? Well, we haven't changed our advice. Uh, our advice on that has been uh, clear from uh, when we first started talking about this. Uh, Ukrainians, uh, it is true, have shown uh, their courage and bravery uh, in taking on uh, this aggressor, uh, and they are calling on every resource and every lever they have uh, to defend themselves. And of course, the United States is standing with them uh, in the provision of our uh, security assistance and in the, in, in the form of our humanitarian supplies, uh, in the form of our uh, broader support. We applaud, we are inspired uh, by their bravery. Uh, at the same time, uh, our guidance remains the same and our travel advisory remains. U.S. citizens should not travel to Ukraine. Those in Ukraine should depart immediately if it is safe for them to do so using commercial or other uh, privately available options for uh, now ground transportation. Uh, importantly, uh, U.S. citizens who travel uh, to Ukraine, uh, especially uh, with the purpose of participating in, in, in fighting there, they face significant risks, uh, including the very real risk of capture or death. The United States, as you know, is not able to provide assistance to evacuate uh, U.S. citizens from, UK, from Ukraine, uh, including those Americans who may decide to travel to Ukraine to participate in the ongoing war. In addition to those other risks to personal safety, uh, and, and this is a point we want to underscore, U.S. citizens should be aware that Russia has stated that it intends to treat foreign fighters in, Uk in Ukraine as quote-unquote mercenaries. Uh, rather than as lawful combatants or prisoners of war. Uh, while we expect Russia to respect all of its obligations under the law of war, uh, in light of this very concerning statement, uh, U.S. citizens detained by Russian authorities in Ukraine 
they may be subject to potential attempts at criminal prosecution uh, and may be at heightened risk for mistreatment. Um, given our obligation to the American people uh, to speak clearly about what we know, we wanted to uh, communicate that uh, in no uncertain terms. So while we continue to urge U.S. citizens not to travel to Ukraine for uh, their own safety, regardless of the underlying purpose, uh, we continue to encourage them uh, to divert their energies towards safe, constructive, uh, volunteer or civil society uh, activities. Uh, we know that the Ukrainian people, uh, they need uh, humanitarian assistance, uh, they need funds, uh, they need advocates for their cause uh, around the world. And we applaud uh, Americans across this country uh, and those around, around the world who are using their skills, their passion, their energy, uh, their resources uh, to assist uh, the various NGOs uh, that are uh, working uh, to support this important mission in the United States uh, or around the world. Uh, as you may know, we have a uh, public page on our um, uh, 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 public uh, how to help section uh, of our United uh, with Ukraine uh, webpage that Americans can find additional resources for supporting them. The physical danger that they might get into in the poor treatment or uh, treatment by, the, by Russians if they're captured, do Americans who travel to Ukraine to, to fight risk any kind of penalty from the from the U.S. government? Uh, this is a question for uh, the Department of Justice. I will just say uh, generally um, that uh, the risk of prosecution is, is not one we're speaking to. Uh, this is a risk to their uh, safety and security. Not, uh, meaning there isn't any? Uh, that I would refer you to the Department of Justice, but uh, my understanding is, uh, is, is that there is not that particular risk. There are other uh, grave risks that we're highlighting. Uh, yes, sir. So we have humanitarian concerns in Ukraine right now that firstly, uh, Russia may somehow use the chemical weapons in Ukraine, and secondly, that uh, it may fabricate finding those biomaterials or organize the leak, blaming Ukraine and telling, okay, here, here, here what we're told about. Uh, the State Department policy from the very beginning was not to classifying um, any information about Russia plans, but to make them public. So I'd like to, to, I'd like to ask your position and your understanding, oh, is it possible? Well, in this instance, we're not speaking to uh, uh, classified information, uh, but we have spoken to our uh, uh, profound concern uh, that this may be a, a real possibility. Uh, and there are really two underlying um, uh, reasons uh, that inform that concern. That concern. Uh, first, we know that Moscow has used these banned substances, substances in the past. Uh, it has used them against uh, dissidents at home. Alexei Navalny uh, is, of course, uh, the most prominent, uh, notorious, I should say, example uh, of that. Uh, the Skripples um, in the United Kingdom using a banned uh, chemical uh, agent on, on British soil. The other concern, uh, what, what the other element that undergirds our concern, is what we discussed yesterday. Uh, and if you were to uh, diagnose the tactics of the Russian Federation, you might uh, call it projection. Uh, but Moscow has a tendency to blame others, to blame Ukraine, to blame the United States, to blame the West, of the very activities that in which it is engaging. And so we take its track record, uh, and we take its tactics, and we marry those two things together, and we see that Russian officials in, in, in recent weeks and, and even more so in recent days with the UN Security Council uh, session that they called today um, have been speaking to the possibility of the United States, of Ukraine, of, of others employing uh, chemical agents, chemical weapons, uh, biological weapons. Um, of course, uh, that is totally false. It is baseless. Uh, our concern, however, is that these baseless accusations uh, do point uh, to potential plans on the part of Moscow. Uh, and so we have been very clear about that concern uh, for a couple reasons. In the first instance, uh, to do all we can through our public messaging uh, and uh, through every uh, means by which we can to deter any such use of uh, chemical weapons, uh, but also to make sure that the world is operating with eyes wide open. And if Russia, uh, in the coming days or coming weeks, uh, claims to have been uh, the victim, claims that uh, Russian speakers, Russian citizens uh, have been the victims uh, of this type of attack, uh, to have a good sense of what this was all about. Uh, this is 
pulled directly from the Kremlin's playbook. This is the playbook that was employed uh, in the lead up to the invasion. It's a playbook that Secretary Blinken sat in that very UN Security Council chamber and warned, warned about uh, several weeks ago now. And it is a playbook that we continue to be concerned uh, that Russia will call upon uh, in the conduct uh, of this unjustified uh, aggression. Andrea. Uh, do you have any evidence beyond their past practice and their claims in this session they called? Uh, I have a couple of other questions. It's also at today's session, China supported this proposition on Russia's behalf. What does that tell you about any hope of President Xi um, well, trying to pull Putin back from this invasion? I will say generally uh, regarding today's session at the UN, um, of course it was called by Russia. Uh, it is a session that, as you heard from uh, Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, uh, that we in many ways embraced uh, because we took advantage of uh, the forum uh, to fight disinformation with the best antidote to, to disinformation, uh, and that's information. And what you heard from Ambassador Thomas Greenfield uh, were the facts. Uh, pure and simple. And what you heard from the Russian Federation, I think it's fair to say it rivals uh, what you might see, what you might find on some of the darkest corners of the internet. Uh, we heard too many lies, uh, too many um, pernicious and, and corrosive lies. Um, I don't want to go through them one by one to, to give them even more oxygen, of course, uh, but there was one in um, my effort to uh, review uh, what the Russian permanent uh, perm rep said uh, that really stuck out because of its vividness. Um, and he spoke about the uh, strike at the maternity ward. Um, we've all seen the harrowing images with, uh, with our own eyes. We've seen video footage from the ground. I know many of your uh, outlets uh, have captured uh, that imagery uh, with your own people uh, on the ground. Uh, but we heard the perm rep refer to this quote unquote allegedly destroyed maternity hospital, claiming that it wasn't destroyed. Uh, we heard him point to photos uh, allegedly taken from inside the building uh, that, according to his account, uh, showed little more than what he called disorder, an overturned chair, overturned furniture, uh, claiming that the building was otherwise uh, intact, uh, not in any way addressing the fact uh, that this was a brutal strike against a maternity hospital uh, that killed uh, innocent uh, Ukrainians. Uh, of course, there was much more uh, when it came to uh, the lies, the fiction, uh, chemical and, and biological uh, efforts. But the fact is that any country that um, stands with, that uh, espouses, that uh, backs up, uh, this, these lies, uh, they too are associating themselves uh, with whatever the Russian Federation uh, may enact uh, in Ukraine. Again, we have deep concerns uh, about what the Russians uh, may be plotting uh, in this regard. Uh, we think all responsible countries uh, should speak out against this. Uh, any responsible, any sentient country uh, could listen to what was coming from the perm rep today uh, and diagnose it for what it is and what it was. Uh, the fact that any country would lend any bit of credence or credibility uh, is uh, disturbing. Uh, it, and it will, again, associate that country uh, with any actions that the Russian Federation undertakes uh, in Ukraine. Jenny. Uh, I, had a, I had another question. Oh, sure. Sorry. Um, my foreign desk is asking uh, whether we have any confirmation of something that may have happened in Moscow, that the fifth directorate of the FSB, in charge of, as you know, foreign intelligence, including Ukraine, has been raided by the FSO, the Federal Protective Service of the Russian Federation, and by President Putin's own security service and that some people may be under house arrest. So I'm not in a position to speak to that particular report. We can let you know if we're uh, in Are a you position. Aware of it? Uh, I, I, I was not aware of this. Uh, it sounds like it, it may have just come out. Um, what, what I will say, however, is that uh, 
certainly in the weeks leading up to Russia's aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we saw, and in the days after, in fact, we saw thousands upon thousands uh, of Russian citizens, private Russian citizens, take to the street, uh, more than 10,000 of whom have been uh, detained for uh, doing nothing more than peacefully exercising uh, the rights that are um, uh, that are uh, as universal in Russia as they are anywhere else uh, in the world. But uh, we also saw uh, senior uh, policy heavyweights, let's say, uh, in Russia uh, speak their opposition to what was then uh, the President Putin's plan. Uh, so we have seen uh, dissent in the streets. Uh, we have seen uh, dissent uh, in uh, elite policy circles uh, in Russia. So I can't speak to uh, this report, but uh, we've certainly seen a broader pattern. Do you Jenny? think this could be connected to how, uh, how seriously wrong their ground game went for the first 16 days of this operation until the moves that we have now seen on the ground overnight? I, I would hesitate to speculate on a report that, that I haven't seen, but uh, what, what I will say is that uh, President Putin has, has claimed uh, that his plan is going according to plan. Uh, I do not think uh, that uh, any political leader, military planner, uh, strategist uh, worth any salt uh, would devise a plan uh, that would be met with stiff opposition, that would be met with uh, fierce and unified international opposition, uh, and that would be met with almost universal uh, global condemnation, uh, and a plan that uh, is now leading Russia into uh, what is a strategic morass of its own making uh, in terms of a, an economy in freefall, a financial system that uh, has now um, given up the gains of uh, integration over the past uh, 30 years, uh, and a strategic positioning in the world uh, that is a far cry uh, from what it might, it might have been uh, before this, and uh, given our export controls, uh, given the diplomatic isolation, uh, given uh, the financial and other economic measures, uh, will be uh, appreciably weaker uh, for uh, some time to come. Jenny. I quickly want to follow up on Simon's question, and then I have another. Uh, is the State Department aware of any Americans who have gone to fight alongside the Ukrainians, and if so, how many? So as you know, Jenny, when Americans travel abroad, they are not required to register with the Department of State in any way. So uh, these are not uh, metrics that we would track. But uh, our goal has been to uh, be very clear uh, with any Americans who would be interested uh, in traveling to Ukraine for any reason, but especially uh, to take up arms of the profound risks uh, that they would they would take uh, they would undertake uh, to their health, to their safety, their security. And then on two of the Americans who are detained in Russia, do you have any update on Brittany Griner? Has she been granted consular access yet? And then Trevor Reed's family says his health is continuing continuing to deteriorate. Um, have have there been specific warnings from the embassy to Moscow about about his health or calls for him to get medical access? Uh, so what I will say is that every time a U.S. citizen is detained anywhere uh, around the world, uh, our uh, diplomats, uh, our consular affairs officers spring into action uh, to provide any and all forms uh, of assistance uh, that we can to those Americans. When it comes to uh, Brittany Griner, uh, of course, we've been working uh, very diligently uh, on this case, um, providing, uh, been in close touch uh, with um, uh, with, uh, with those around her, providing all uh, forms of appropriate support, and we'll continue to do that. Uh, when it comes to Paul Whelan, when it comes to Trevor Reed, both of whom traveled uh, to Russia as tourists and have since been held uh, on an unjustified, uh, wrongful basis uh, since then, uh, we have uh, been in a position to um, provide various forms of support. Uh, the embassy uh, was uh, able to pay consular visits uh, to both men. Uh, late last year. Uh, as you know, the president spoke to Trevor Reed's family uh, earlier this week when uh, the president uh, had traveled to, uh, to Texas. Uh, we are uh, not going to uh, comment on reports about Mr. Reed's uh, health. We're of, close, we're of course uh, monitoring uh, his welfare, uh, the welfare of Paul Whelan and of uh, all Americans uh, who may be detained in, in Russia uh, very closely. Uh, we, continuous, we consistently advocate for uh, fair treatment uh, from Russian authorities, and we continue to call for their immediate release. Connor. Uh, 
they have not heard back after the president's conversation. His conversation came only after they were planning to protest outside of the venue in Texas where he was appearing. And do you have anything further about Trevor Reed? Andrea, I can tell you that these are cases uh, that uh, this department is uh, focused on every single day. Uh, Secretary Blinken, uh, Roger Karstens, the president, Jake Sullivan, uh, have had an opportunity to speak to uh, the families of uh, wrongful detainees uh, around the world, including uh, those who were, who were held in Russia. Uh, we continue to make it a priority uh, to secure their release. Uh, we have done that since the very first day uh, of this administration. Uh, and in fact, uh, our point person uh, is someone who uh, has worked these issues uh, uh, long before uh, January 20th. Roger Karstens uh, was working these cases uh, in the last administration. And the continuity uh, that we sought, uh, given the paramount importance and the priority uh, we attach to these cases, uh, speaks to the fact that he has been um, uh, a through line across administrations. And on the same day he was busy in Venezuela, understandably, he was coming back, that, I think, that very day. Um, have you provided any other details about what might have been done? There were a lot of charges from Senator Rubio and others that there was some quid pro quo. There was no quid pro quo. There, there, was, there was absolutely no quid pro quo. Uh, we have been working to secure the release of uh, those Americans who are uh, wrongfully detained in, in Venezuela, again, uh, since the very start of, of this administration. Uh, for us, uh, there uh, can be uh, uh, no trade-off. Uh, uh, the release of Americans around the world uh, is something that uh, we advocate for, we work for, uh, pulling uh, every, level, every, every lever at uh, our disposal. Connor. Well, concluding on that first, um, since that's where we are right now, just uh, the Venezuelan opposition has said that the administration should not buy any Venezuelan oil unless the Maduro regime makes uh, commitments within talks. Um, you've said that you've sort of left the door open to, to purchases um, after they've committed verbally to talks. Would you rule out purchases until they actually take some sort of um, irreversible steps? Uh, what... Let me make a couple points. Uh, the delegation that was in Caracas uh, just a few days ago uh, had two priorities in mind. Uh, one was uh, the release of these very Americans we have been discussing. Uh, and of course, uh, Special Envoy Karstens was able to return home with two of those Americans. Uh, there are additional Americans whose uh, safe return we are continuing to uh, work on uh, as a uh, overriding priority uh, for this department. And we'll continue to do that until all of them uh, have been reunited with their family. Uh, the second, their families, uh, the second priority uh, was uh, championing the democratic aspirations of the Venezuelan people, uh, making very clear uh, in a frank uh, and candid uh, way to the Maduro regime uh, that we continue to stand with, to support uh, the Venezuelan people and uh, their aspirations for a government that is responsive uh, to their needs. Uh, we've been clear uh, since this visit and long before this visit that uh, our current Venezuela-related sanctions remain in full effect. Uh, these sanctions deny the regime, uh, the revenue streams uh, that would finance uh, repression and line the pockets of regime officials, uh, as well as uh, protect uh, the U.S. financial system from exposure uh, to what otherwise would be corrupt and illicit financial flows. Um, we, of course, don't speak to uh, or preview sanctions actions, um, but we've also said that we would review some sanctions policies if and only if the Venezuelan parties made meaningful progress uh, in the Venezuelan-led negotiations in Mexico uh, towards achieving, fulfilling uh, those aspirations of the Venezuelan people uh, for a true, for a genuine democracy. Question about Syria: Have you just have you seen any indication that some of these Syrian forces have actually been brought by Russia to Ukraine? Uh, that is not something I could speak to from here. Um, the the reports of uh, the Russian Federation and President Putin calling on uh, recruits from other conflict zones that alone uh, is a sign of uh, a deeply troubling sign of further escalation. And then on um, diplomacy, 
has there you said yesterday there's been no outreach basically from the state department to the russian government um why hasn't there been i mean it, you you championed diplomacy throughout this time and and obviously you say that russia is not engaging in good faith but if it would make any kind of difference to to at least have some sort of you know letter call whatever from the administration to the russian government why not you take that opportunity Connor, the moment we thought that our intervention in that particular way uh, could lead to uh, progress, could lead to a breakthrough, uh, could diminish the violence, could save lives, uh, we would do so. Uh, right now, there are a number of close partners uh, who are engaged directly uh, with the Russian Federation. That includes the French, and we saw uh, President Macron in person uh, earlier this week on our way home from Europe. That includes Prime Minister Bennett of Israel. We saw Foreign Minister Lapid in Europe earlier this week. That includes uh, the, uh, our Turkish allies. Uh, the President had an opportunity to speak to uh, President Erdogan uh, yesterday uh, to hear about, um, uh, uh, to hear about uh, that engagement. It includes the Germans. Uh, of course, we've been in close touch uh, at the Foreign Minister level and at the level of the Chancellor as well. Uh, so all of these diplomatic efforts have been done in full coordination and consultation uh, with the United States. Uh, there has not been, and to the contrary, uh, the United States has not been absent uh, from uh, this process. Uh, this process involves uh, a number of different steps. Uh, we are uh, supporting our Ukrainian partners. We are supportive of uh, the diplomatic engagements that uh, our close partners are undertaking in full consultation and coordination uh, with us. Uh, just as uh, we are working uh, and in many ways leading the international community to uh, impose increasing costs on the Russian Federation for its aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we, see these, uh, we see these various missions as, as complementary. Jenny. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Nice to hear. Thank you. I have a couple of questions on the South Korea and North Korea and China. First question is, the South Korean president-elect, Yoon sung yeol said he would take decisive actions against North Korea's illegal and unreasonable behavior. What can you assess his uh, defensive uh, efforts against North Korea? Well, Jenny, the uh, advantage uh, we have in, in terms of our relationship uh, with countries like South Korea is that it is a uh, relationship, in this case, is, it is an alliance uh, that transcends political parties, it transcends individuals, uh, it is uh, uh, bigger than that. And so uh, we look forward to, and we have congratulate, uh, congratulated President-elect uh, Yoon sung Yul on his election. We look forward to uh, working with him and his full uh, government, uh, because we know that uh, together we'll be able to continue to deepen uh, the economic ties, the close people-to-people -people ties between our two countries, uh, and our uh, cooperation on matters of uh, regional and broader international security. Uh, and as we discussed yesterday, uh, of course, there is no more uh, pressing challenge to uh, peace and security in, the, uh, uh, in Northeast Asia uh, than the DPRK's uh, illicit ballistic missile and nuclear weapons program. Uh, so just as we have uh, worked very closely on a bilateral basis uh, with uh, our South Korean allies and on a trilateral basis with our South Korean allies and Japanese allies together, uh, we'll continue to do that with uh, the new South Korean government going forward. Yeah, on North Korea, um, North Korean Kim Jong-un visit Dong Changni satellite launch site yesterday. Uh, and preparing to launch ICBM missile soon. Do you have any information on this? Uh, that's not something I would be able to, to speak to. Okay. The ultimate goal of the North Korea's excessive missile launch is to lift sanctions against the North Korea. Does the United States have any plans to lift the sanctions for dialogue with North Korea? Uh, so, uh, Jenny, we are focused on uh, substantive, practical, pragmatic diplomacy, uh, working in uh, full coordination with uh, our allies in the Indo-Pacific, in this case, uh, the Japanese and our South Korean allies. Uh, we seek, together with them, uh, to make progress 
against what is our shared overall objective, and that's the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we are ready and willing to engage uh, in dialogue uh, with the DPRK to include uh, direct dialogue with the DPRK. Uh, we have made our uh, willingness to engage abundantly clear. Uh, I did so again uh, yesterday from here. We've also made abundantly clear that we harbor no hostile intent uh, towards the DPRK, uh, and that is why we have uh, repeatedly underscored uh, our willingness to uh, engage. It is now up to the DPRK to determine uh, if it wishes to engage. Uh, of course, in recent days, rather than engagement, uh, we have seen additional provocations. Uh, and so uh, even in recent days, uh, we have worked uh, with uh, our, our partners and allies on, at, in the UN, uh, and of course with our uh, allies in Northeast Asia, um, the ROK in Japan, on uh, ensuring that uh, we take appropriate action to hold uh, the DPRK accountable for these provocations. Last one. Uh, North Korea and China are uncooperative Russian sanctions. What disadvantage are, uh, do you have for considering for these countries disadvantage towards in China because China is not participate sanctions against Russia? Sorry, was your question about the PRC's enforcement yeah, PRC, of sanctions against Russia yeah, or DPRK? Yeah, DPRK also. Well, China. so uh, it is incumbent upon, when it comes to the DPRK, uh, and, and much the same could be said of, of, of Russia for that matter, uh, it is incumbent on uh, all countries, uh, all, uh, especially all responsible countries, uh, to fully implement uh, the uh, international sanctions regime, regimes uh, that are in place. In the case of the DPRK, uh, the DPRK's illicit uh, ballistic missile and nuclear weapons program, it is not in our uh, security interest, to be sure. It's not in the security interest of our uh, allies in the Indo-Pacific, but it's not also uh, in the interest of uh, the PRC. Uh, and uh, it is incumbent upon all uh, responsible actors to enforce the sanctions that are on the books uh, to contain this program, to confine it, uh, and to hold the DPRK uh, accountable for its violations of multiple UN Security Council resolutions over the course of many years. Canadian Department uh, today uh, announced that uh, there is uh, additional sanctions against North Korea. Do we have anything on that? We don't preview sanctions activities, but uh, again, uh, speaking to the provocations, additional provocations from the DPRK in even recent days, I would not be surprised if we have more to say on that before too long. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Price. Jason Calderon from NTN24 here. Uh, as you know, yesterday, President Biden announced the designation of Colombia as a major non-NATO ally. What exactly does this designation mean? Does it make any difference in the relations of uh, the two countries? And also, when is going to be sent the notification to the Congress? Well, this designation is uh, notable for a number of reasons. Um, first, it makes Colombia only the third uh, major non-NATO ally in the, American, in the Americas. Uh, we recently bestowed the status upon, uh, upon Qatar uh, and other countries, but uh, Colombia is now only the third country uh, in the United States to have uh, been afforded the status. Um, this designation provides uh, a long-term framework for our security and defense cooperation, uh, and it further reinforces the already strong uh, cooperation uh, and bilateral defense cooperation and relationship uh, between the United States and Colombia. Uh, it helps to support our joint defense planning, uh, procurement, uh, training activities. Um, some of the advantages uh, of this status also include eligibility for collaboration on the development of various defense technologies, uh, privileged access to the U.S. defense industry, uh, and increase uh, increased joint uh, military exchanges, exercises, trainings, uh, as well as special access to military uh, equipment uh, and financing. Uh, and the fact that we are able to <coughs> grant this status to Colombia uh, speaks to the fact that uh, together we enjoy one of the closest um, defense and security relationships uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, we have a, a vigorous military to military partnership. Um, we share any number of interests uh, in the hemisphere. Uh, and in some cases, uh, well beyond. Could this send a message to Venezuela's regime? 
Well, I, I think the message it sends uh, is that we value Colombia uh, as a partner. Uh, when it comes to Venezuela, Colombia uh, has been uh, a, a very uh, generous uh, in terms of opening its doors, opening its collective arms uh, to uh, millions of Venezuelans who have been forced uh, by repression, uh, by uh, economic uh, deprivation to flee their homes uh, and to cross the border into Colombia. And we are deeply appreciative uh, of the generosity uh, that the Colombian people and the Colombian government have demonstrated to their Venezuelan neighbors. Do they send a notification to the Congress? Uh, there's a process that's involved in, in each one of these, um, uh, in each one of these um, uh, announcements. And so I suspect at the earliest opportunity. Uh, yes, sir. A couple of things on Ukraine. Um, actually, there were some uh, reports uh, yesterday um, claiming that the U.S. is looking at the possibility to deliver Russian-made, you know, S-300s to Ukraine. Um, you know, Greece, Bulgaria, and Slovakia have these missiles, as we know. So um, are you guys talking to these countries on this issue, delivering the S-300s to Ukraine? So we don't detail uh, every system that we have provided or that we're potentially considering providing uh, to our Ukrainian partners. What we have detailed uh, is the aggregate uh, amount of that security assistance. Right now, it well exceeds $1 billion uh, over the past year. It exceeds uh, $250 million or so uh, in recent days alone. In terms of the broad categories, we've provided our Ukrainian partners uh, with what they need uh, for their self-defense. Uh, that includes anti-armor systems, anti-tank systems, uh, anti-aircraft uh, systems, and we discussed that at some length yesterday, small arms, munitions, uh, other systems that will allow our Ukrainian partners uh, to most effectively um, defend themselves, defend themselves against the Russian aggressors. So um, right now, everybody knows that Kyiv is under siege by the Russian forces. And in a, I mean, from a uh, realistic perspective, nobody knows what's going to happen you know, next couple of weeks. So does the Biden administration have a plan B in case you know, Zelensky government would fall? We have been in close consultations with uh, President Zelensky, uh, with others in his government. Uh, we know that they have undertaken uh, the appropriate uh, planning, and I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. Andrea. Uh, one final question, yes. One final, yeah. okay, on, on Turkey. I mean, actually, I was going to ask about Turkey's uh, recent efforts, uh, you know, uh, on the Ukraine thing. You know, since the beginning, Turkey has been acting in line with NATO alliance and at the same time, you know, has been speaking with Moscow and Kiev at the you know, same time. So what would you say about Turkey's role at a, as a mediator between Moscow and Kiev uh, from now? We welcome it. Uh, we welcome it uh, precisely because uh, our Turkish allies have done so in full coordination and consultation with the United States. Uh, as as I, I said a moment ago, President Biden had an opportunity to speak to President Erdogan uh, after uh, the Antalya uh, discussions. Uh, Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to speak to Foreign Minister Chavasolu uh, just the other day before uh, the Antalya uh, discussions. Uh, so any diplomatic effort uh, that is uh, conducted just as we uh, had conducted our diplomacy with the Russian Federation. That is to say, in full consultation and coordination with uh, our allies and partners, that is something that we welcome. Andrea. Let me ask you uh, again about war crimes. This, the Vice President uh, made some mention of this again today. She said, we are clear that any intentional attack we're targeting of civilians is a war crime, period. Do you, do, does the United States believe that the attack on the Paternity Hospital in Mariupol was intentional or an accident? Do well, you that, that's that the attack on the civilians trying to um, leave in those humanitarian corridors that were violated were intentional or were accidental? So that is the challenging aspect when it comes to a potential war crimes designation. There is no doubt that civilians have been killed uh, by Russian bombs, Russian missiles, uh, um, Russian forces. Uh, the element that requires uh, due diligence and investigation is that element of intentionality. Uh, was it the intent of Russian uh, fighter jets? Was it the intention of uh, Russian commanders at sea uh, to uh, drop munitions, to fire missiles, uh, to use force against civilians? Uh, and so that is what uh, we are in the process ourselves of documenting. That is what we are in the process of uh, supporting uh, these investigations that are ongoing. 
uh, around the world to determine whether uh, there was an intentional targeting of, of civilians in this context. Effort by the United States in contrast to the 39 countries that are going much further and saying, as the British Foreign Secretary said here in Washington yesterday, this was a war crime, period. Is there a distinction here because the United States is trying to preserve some ability to compromise a way out in the future, a, a negotiation with Vladimir Putin? So he's not already been labeled a, a war criminal? Andrea, I, I think the actions that the United States uh, has organized, uh, has galvanized, um, and has implemented uh, against the Russian Federation, uh, measures from sanctions to uh, export controls, designations uh, that have had a devastating effect on the Russian economy, I think that should speak to the fact that we're not trying to preserve currency uh, with the Russian Federation. We are doing everything we can to impose pressure uh, on Vladimir Putin, uh, on those around him, to bring them to the negotiating table. So I can tell you uh, that the only uh, criterion in our mind when it comes to war crimes is whether uh, it meets that uh, definition, the definition that's defined uh, in the Geneva Conventions. Uh, and you put your finger on uh, what, what can be a challenging element to ascertain. Uh, but we are using every resource at our disposal, and we are supporting uh, the various uh, investigative efforts that are out there uh, to determine, to attempt to determine uh, if these are war crimes. Yes, uh, final question. I have a follow-up question on North Korea. Uh, North Korea has tested the ICBM test system. Uh, so uh, will there uh, be uh, any policy change on the North Korea? And uh, regarding the additional sanctions, which is supposed to be announced today, uh, do you think it will have a negative effect on possible dialogue with North Korea? Well, um, this the tests that you refer to, the uh, testing of an ICBM uh, system, is something that uh, North Korea uh, attempted to hide and something that the United States uh, announced to the world yesterday. Uh, the decision to pursue uh, these escalating tests, including uh, these last uh, two tests, uh, they raise tensions. They are destabilizing uh, to uh, the broader region. So the door does remain open to diplomacy, as I said before. Uh, we remain uh, ready uh, and willing to engage in practical, pragmatic diplomacy with our uh, allies and partners. But we will take all necessary measures uh, to ensure the security of uh, our homeland and to ensure the security uh, of our allies, including our allies in uh, Japan and, and South Korea. Uh, so just a couple examples uh, from this week. Earlier this week, uh, the US Indo-Pacific Command uh, ordered intensified ISR, that's uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance collection activities uh, in the Yellow Sea, uh, as well as enhanced readiness among our ballistic missile defense forces uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, the Department of uh, the Treasury, as we've said before, uh, has a number of um, authorities at, at its disposal. And we have um, previously held uh, those who have supported the proliferation of these technologies, of uh, those who have supported uh, the uh, DPRK's illicit uh, nuclear weapons and ballistic missile programs. We've held them accountable, and I have no doubt uh, we will continue to use those authorities to good effect uh, to hold uh, uh, all uh, those responsible uh, who may be supporting this program. Connor. Um, Saudi Arabia said that it uh, freed from captivity two U.S. citizens through a special security operation. Um, the State Department didn't use that same language. You guys called it the safe departure of two U.S. citizens from an area of Yemen currently under Houthi control. I'm wondering if you can provide some clarity. Were these women in Houthi captivity or, or otherwise obstructed um, from departing the country by the Houthis? Uh, we, we released a statement on that yesterday. Uh, there are some additional uh, details in there. We're not in a position to provide uh, a full set of details given uh, privacy and other considerations, but uh, we welcome uh, the safe return of these uh, two American citizens. Can you say which one it is, though? Were they, were they being detained? We issued a statement on that. You you, uh, you, you noted the statement we used. Uh, were you pushed out? Or no, we, provi we provided it yesterday. Okay. Um, can I just ask you one thing on Saudi? Sure. Rafe Badali? Yes. Do you have anything to say about his release? Uh, of course, these are issues that we have uh, uh, addressed uh, at senior levels uh, with our Saudi partners. 
Uh, we have made very clear that human rights are at the center of our uh, foreign policy. I think you've seen that uh, in our engagements in the Middle East uh, and uh, around the world. Uh, so every time there is uh, progress when it comes to human rights, uh, it uh, helps us advance an even closer partnership, an even closer relationship uh, with uh, our, uh, our, our partners and allies. Uh, certainly would welcome uh, this release. But, but you don't seem you know, overjoyed about it. Is it basically because you think it should have happened a long time ago? Well, we'll, uh, we'll get you more details on this. Right. Thank you all very much.